Hi, my name is Tim Martin. I am with the Centers for Apologetics Research, and today we're talking about kind of a tricky subject. Well, uh, almost any group that I would talk to you about, um, I feel like I need to start with saying, now this group is really different from any other. Well, yeah, all of them are different and unique in their own ways. However, with the Seventh-day Adventists, uh, the way they're kind of different and the challenge that we have with them is that I think of any group that I might cover, they are probably more widely accepted by evangelicals than probably pretty much any other group that I'll ever talk about. A lot of you probably have come here with your preconceived ideas of who they are, or what they believe, and a, a lot of times I'll hear from folks that, you know, I don't think the Seventh-day Adventists, they're, they're not that far off just because they, they go to church on Saturday instead of Sunday. Well, I, I've got to agree, if that was the only issue, I wouldn't be up here talking about them. I wouldn't spend the last several days immersed in this PowerPoint trying to get all my slides right if the only thing was that they went to church on Saturday. There's other groups that go to church on Saturday. Look at this quotation. I'll, I'll tell you about this, the book that I'm quoting this from here in a, just a little bit, but look at this statement. The futility of salvation by works. God's ministry of reconciliation reveals the futility of human endeavors to obtain salvation through works of the law. Gratitude of those who have experienced forgiveness makes obedience a joy. Works, then, are not the ground of salvation, but its fruitage. I hope you don't see any problems with that statement. That sounds gospel to me. See, they can make statements like that and be true to their doctrine. And, I mean, if somebody told you this is what they believe, wouldn't you say, hey, well, amen, welcome into the family, brother? Because they can make statements like that. But you're going to see some statements that you're going to scratch your head and wonder, how can they make this statement along with some of these other things that we're going to look at? So keep in mind, just because somebody can articulate something so beautiful as this, still doesn't mean that there's not something else going on underneath. And let's look at some of this. So our first subject always when looking at a group is, well, where does their authority come from? What is the main thing that they look to to tell them what truth is? And for the Seventh-day Adventists, so first of all, let me tell you about the book that I'm quoting here. This is uh, Seventh-day Adventist Belief, uh, Believe, which is a book um, published by them. Um, this book here is copyrighted, uh, the second edition in 2005, by the Ministerial Association of the General Conference of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. So it's not just written by some theologian putting his own ideas on here. This is a book published by their organization that are explaining what they call their 28 fundamentals of belief. Kind of like we have a doctrinal statement here at this church. I don't know how many numbers there are, how many we have, but they have 28 fundamentals of belief in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this book is published to give explanation to each one of those fundamentals of belief. But this is an exposition of the fundamental beliefs of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. So hopefully, if we, if we wanted to study what does the organization teach, not just does, what does this professor teach or what does this individual down the street say, but the organization as a whole, that should be the important thing to us. Uh, for me, as I understand Seventh-day Adventist doctrine as we're going to look at it, if a person were to read it, if they bypass certain parts of it, they might understand the gospel. But if you understand their teachings as a whole, I think the gospel is definitely a, a problem here. So under the issue of authority, it says, one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit is prophecy. This gift is an identifying mark of the remnant church and was manifested in the ministry of Ellen G. White. Now, another different thing about Seventh-day Adventism, they, they don't have like Mormons where Joseph Smith stands up and I'm going to start this church and he's looked at as the founder or, or other groups like this. When they started, Ellen White was, was one main character and we'll, we'll see some other characters here in a little bit, but she was one of the main characters, but she was different from all the rest because she had this thing called the spirit of prophecy. As the Lord's messengers, her writings are a continuing and authoritative source of truth, which provide for the church comfort, guidance, instruction, and correction. The thing that should jump out at us is this thing here, the underlying continuing and authoritative source for truth. It's not commentary, 
It's not just helpful little devotional material. Continuing an authoritative source of truth. I encourage Christians to get commentaries. When you read the Bible and do your devotions or quiet times or whatever you, you call them, use, use devotional material for, like commentaries to help. I mean, these, these theologians that we've had that study the Bible all their lives in you know, deep scholarly ways can really reveal things to us that we just miss that are in the scriptures. I encourage that, but that's not what they're saying of her. When you're saying continuing an authoritative source of truth, now you're gone up to another level. This is now more than just that. It's from God is what she is telling us. And that's how it functions in the lives of the Seventh-day Adventists. Now, she doesn't use the term prophet. She never did. What she, she uses the term, she liked the term the Lord's messenger. And that's what they'll refer to her as, perhaps. She has the gift of prophecy. Uh, she is the Lord's messenger. Now, in our minds, that kind of dumbs it down a little bit. Okay, she's not claiming to be a prophet. She's the Lord's messenger. Doesn't that sound better to say Lord's messenger than prophet? But what does the Lord's messenger mean to her is the question. And by the way, the, the last paragraph is important to throw in here. They also make clear that the Bible is the standard by which all teaching and experience must be tested. Well, they throw in that there. That makes us feel a little bit better. Okay, the Bible's important, but still, if Ellen White has given her continuing an authoritative instruction on a passage, guess what you're going to believe? What you think the passage says or what Ellen White told you? The two Seventh-day Adventists disagree about a passage and they're arguing about it. The Seventh-day Adventists who can find a quote by Ellen White on what that passage really means is the one who wins. The case is settled. It's done. The Lord's messenger has spoken. And what is a Lord's messenger? The gift of prophecy was active in the ministry of Ellen White, one of the founders of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. She has given inspired instruction for God's people living during the time of the end. Again, we have our inspired instruction. So the things that she's writing shouldn't be regarded as just simply writing. Imagine us thinking of the letters of the Apostle Paul as well. That's just his writing given his opinion. No, it's inspired from God to instruct people, the letters of the Apostle Paul that, that we have. And that's how these things would function in the lives of Seventh-day Adventists. It's inspired instruction. Why have I not claimed to be a prophet? These are her words. Because in these days, many who boldly claim that they are prophets are, re are a reproach to the cause of Christ and because my work includes much more than the words of a prophet signifies. To claim to be a prophetess is something that I have never done. See, so she's the Lord's messenger. Does that mean that she's claiming a lesser title than a prophet? Well, no, because to her, the term um, the, the messenger is loftier, it's higher. And it's almost like she's given a false humility. Oh, you know, I don't claim to be a prophetess, no, because I do much more than that. Okay. Now, for us as Christians, we look at the scriptures, some things for us to, to point out and to remember, like Deuteronomy 13, 1 through 3 here, says, if, if a prophet or a dreamer of dream arises among you and gives you sign or a wonder, and the sign or a wonder comes true concerning what you spoke, saying, let us go after other gods whom you have not known, and let us serve them, you shall not listen to the words of that prophet. So, so if somebody comes up and says, I'm some kind of prophet or a Lord's messenger, and tries to give signs and wonders, even if those things happen. There's so many people uh, today, evangelicals not uh, running after Seventh-day Adventism, but we have the mindset of, well, this person gave this prophecy or this prediction or impression or whatever they want to call it, and it came true. I saw a healing, therefore, what they're telling me is true. Just because they can do a miracle doesn't mean they are speaking with the mouthpiece of God. And many false prophets are supposed to raise up in the last days, according to Christ and the apostles that are trying to deceive. Just because they can do that, the idea is we need to look and see what are they teaching. Let us follow after other gods. Now, they never really make it that easy, though. You know, you, you, you don't get like the Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons knocking on your door and say, Hi, we're of the, of the local cult and we're wondering if you would like to come join. <laughs> You know, we, we are teaching doctrines for the commandments of men, and we would wonder if you'd like to come and see what we're doing on Sunday morning. You know, they don't make it that easy. So 
Deuteronomy 13, excellent as a test for truth. However, we need to remember they don't make it as easy as just coming up to you and saying, let's go after other gods. Listen through this and see, is she asking us to believe in a different God or a different gospel? What is it? And another thing, Acts 17, verse 11, this is after Paul had been teaching people in Berea. It says, now these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. Examining the scriptures daily. They didn't just say, well, Paul said it. That settles the question. It was, Paul said it. Let's go and look and see if this is really what's going on. And that's what we need to do as Christians all the time, not just say, well, Ellen White said it, or Pastor Tony said it, or whoever. What does the scripture say? We need to use our own minds and our own hearts and go to the Lord to find out, is this the truth? So the first topic I want to talk to you about is the, something called the investigative judgment. Uh, we mentioned it just slightly the other day. I wanted to wait till we got to Seventh-day Adventists to really explore what this doctrine is. And this is the doctrine that people don't really know and understand about. If they did, they wouldn't be so quick to say, ah, who cares if they worship God on Saturday? They're still Christians. Let's get into this doctrine and see what it's about. First of all, let me give you the background of where this comes from, and you've heard some of this. There's this guy named William Miller, who's a uh, Baptist back in the early 1800s. And he was reading his Bible and putting together a lot of different verses. But one key verse is this one here, Daniel 8:14 in the New American Standard says, And he said unto me, For 2,300 evenings and mornings, then the holy place will be properly restored. Or the sanctuary would be cleansed, the way I think other versions say. He takes this as a prophecy that in 2,300 years, from the decree of rebuilding Jerusalem from 2,300 years from there, the holy place would probably be restored, meaning Jesus would be coming back. So he puts this all together and he develops this timeline between March 21st, 1843 and 1844, Christ would be coming back based on Daniel 8:14 and, and other passages. He puts this together and thousands of people jump into what I call Miller's stream. They agree with him, they think he's great, what he's teaching is wonderful, and they start following what he's teaching. Well, March 21st, 1844 comes and goes. Nothing happens and people are disappointed. Miller is still staying strong though, even, even a week afterwards, he's still thinking that the end is coming, the end is coming close. Well, after this, in, uh, in August, this guy here, Samuel Snow, gives another prediction. He says, the date's October 22nd, 1844. That's gonna be the real date. When that date happens, comes, then Christ is coming back and we know for sure this is gonna happen. He announces this date, everybody jumps on board. Okay, we have the new date. October 22nd comes and goes and nothing happens. They call this date the Great Disappointment which you can imagine, people are weeping and wailing and falling apart. The great disappointment, Christ did not come back. Imagine yourself expecting Christ to come back. You would quit your job, you would, what, what, would think, what would you do if you thought Christ was coming back in the next week or the next month? Probably wouldn't be doing laundry, right? You'd probably quit your job. I mean, who wants to be doing laundry right before Christ comes back, you know? Man, I wasted that day. Or whatever. The great disappointment, nothing happened. Now from here, as I've shown you before on our talk about Millerism, there's an explosion of, of people going off in many different directions. We get um, strains of uh, uh, people who shooting off that end up being the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Worldwide Church of God with uh, Herbert W. Armstrong, uh, Church of God of the Abrahamic Faith. Many different groups blow up from here because they're trying, a lot of these groups are trying to find what is the real date but some groups did something different. What they did is they said, the date was right, but what we were expecting was wrong. And Seventh-day Adventist Church is one of them. And this is how they did it. A guy named Hiram Edson, after the great disappointment, he's walking through his fields, just utterly shaken up and disappointed that nothing happened. And then he has a vision. In his vision, he sees Christ came into this different places, different compartment in heaven to start a new work. And that's what happened on October 22nd, was Christ started some kind of new work in heaven. So they were right on the date, but they were wrong on what was supposed to happen. 
according to this vision that he had. Well, he, he starts to write about his vision and what he saw. This guy here, Joseph Bates, this is another key founder of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. In 1847, he starts to, to read of Edson's visions, and he said, this is great. This is like the best of anything I've ever seen to explain what happened. So he takes this to one of his ministry associates, Ellen White. Ellen White reads this, and she has a vision that endorses Edson's vision. And now this becomes one of the hallmarks of Seventh-day Adventist doctrine. The investigative judgment is one of the most distinct beliefs that they have compared to any other groups, the investigative judgment. So that's the background of where the doctrine came from. But what is the doctrine? What is the investigative judgment? So we, we know from Edson's vision, Christ went into this different place in heaven and started something new. How is this doctrine developed and what do they believe about it now? They say there is a sanctuary in heaven, the true tabernacle which the Lord set up and not man. In it, Christ ministers on our behalf, making available to believers the benefits of his atoning sacrifice offered once for all on the cross. He was inaugurated as our great high priest and began his intercessory ministry at this time of his ascension. So he dies here on earth, he begins his, after he ascends to heaven, now he's beginning his intercessory ministry for us. That's what happened at this point. But now in 1844, they're pointing back to the great disappointment, in 1844, at the end of the prophetic period of 2,300 days, he entered the second and last phase of his atoning ministry. It is a work of investigative judgment, which is a part of the ultimate disposition of all sin, typified by the cleansing of the ancient Hebrew sanctuary on the Day of Atonement. Now, important thing to point out here is it says the last phase of his atoning ministry. So, in 1844, he enters into this inner sanctuary in heaven and begins the last phase of his atoning ministry. Now, what does that mean for us? If he's still working through the atonement, the atonement's not complete. If the atonement's not complete, there's no guarantee of forgiveness. There's no guarantee of salvation. There's no guarantee of where you're going to be after this life because he's still working through the last phase of this atoning ministry. And what's he going to do? He's, his, his work is about the ultimate disposition of all sin. It's not taken care of solely on the cross. Something else has to be done in this inner sanctuary in heaven, and that's what he's working on. Continuing on with this, well, for, first of all, I, I, I divide this up to help us think through what they're saying. This investigative judgment that he's doing accomplishes two things for us, or for God, or, for, or you'll see for who in a minute. The investigative judgment reveals to heavenly intelligences, which, let me explain right there, those are angels, okay? Investigative judgment reveals to angels who among the dead are asleep in Christ, and therefore in him are deemed worthy to have part in this first resurrection. So the investigative judgment helps angels understand who's going to be resurrected. Okay, good for the angels. They can know now. And the next part, it also makes manifest who among the living are abiding in Christ, keeping the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus and in him, therefore are ready for translation into the everlasting kingdom. So the first thing it does for us is it helps the angels know who's going to be resurrected. And the second thing, it helps the angels know who among the living are worthy also. And we might think in terms of rapture or whatever, translated the words that they use there. So this is going to help those angels know. Isn't that nice that the angels get, have a way to know? Why is this needed? Why, why, why do we need the investigative judgment so the angels can figure this out? Well, get, get this for an answer. This judgment vindicates the justice of God in saving those who believe in Jesus. It declares that those who have remained loyal to God shall re um, those who have remained loyal to God shall receive the kingdom. Question: Does God's justice need to be vindicated? Especially to the angels? It just doesn't even make sense why someone would want to believe that the... So if he didn't do the investigative judgment, then what, the angels throughout eternity would be going and saying, I don't know if that guy really should be in here. 
I just, I just, I just, you know, I saw his life, man. So, no, he's not. We don't need the justice of God to be vindicated. Last part here, the completion of this ministry of Christ will mark the close of human probation before the second advent. So, when Jesus is finished with the investigative judgment, it's over. Jesus is coming, pack your bags kind of thing. You need to be ready to go. You don't know when the investigative judgment is going to be over. I mean, he's going to be investigating the lives of everybody who's ever lived and also the lives of everybody who are living. You don't know if your name's already been covered yet. He might have already gone through your life. It might be too late. We are on probation. Well, so I'm only going to be quoting from two different sources during uh, the talk on Seventh-day Adventism. So we, the first one, their um, um, 27, their 28 fundamentals of belief being expounded upon. And this one here, the Great Qu Controversy. This was written by Ellen White. It's one of the most, their most popular and esteemed books, basically because it teaches the core of Seventh-day Adventism. If you were to get this book and read it uh, and be convinced of it, there would be no reason for you not to join because it has all of their core beliefs and teachings in it. Ellen White here says, all who have truly repented of sin and by faith claim the blood of Christ as their atoning sacrifice have had pardon entered against their names in their books of heaven. Now, right there again, here's a statement that we can say, as we understand these terms, yeah. All who have truly repented of sins uh, by faith claim the blood of Christ, we've ha had our names written in the books of heaven. Well, that's good news, right? But then the following paragraph after the semicolon here, as they have been become partakers of the righteousness of Christ and their characters are found in harmony with the law of God, their sins will be blotted out and they themselves will be counted worthy of eternal life. So you're not counted worthy of an eternal life until your sins are blotted out and your sins are not blotted out until Jesus does this investigative judgment to see if your life is in accord with the law of God. So the Seventh-day Adventists can say, yeah, we're Christians, you're Christians, we're all Christians. Our names are written in, in the book of life, in heaven, in the inner sanctuary. That sounds Christian. How can, the, how can you get away from that? Until you read the rest of the story of what they're saying. It's not. Back to their um, explanation of their fundamental truths. It says human beings fall into three, uh, one of three classes. Number one would be the wicked who reject God's authority. So those would be those who just absolutely not, I don't believe in Jesus, they reject God. Number two, genuine believers who trusting in the merits of Christ through faith live in obedience to God's law. And this third group would be those who appear to be genuine believers but are not. The purpose of the investigative judgment then is to see what group you're in. Now, if your name is written in the inner sanctuary in heaven, you know you're not part of number one. So our names, according to Seventh-day Adventists' belief, our names would be written there. But any atheist would say, no, not be there. The Muslim, no, it wouldn't be there. But for the people who claim the name of Christ and believe in Jesus, our name is written there. So the purpose of the investigative judgment now is to decide, are we number two or are we number three? Which part do we fall into? Ellen White said, the intercession of Christ and man's behalf in the sanctuary above is as essential to the plan of salvation as was his death on the, upon the cross. By his death, he began that work, which after his resurrection, he ascended to complete in heaven. His work is not complete. But lastly here, the subject of the sanctuary and the investigative judgment should be clearly understood by the people of God all need a knowledge for themselves of the position and work of the great high priest. Otherwise, it will be impossible for them to exercise the faith which is essential at this time to, or to occupy the position which God designs them to fill. See, now not only is it essential that Jesus do this work of investigative judgment, it's essential for you to even know about it and believe it and have faith in this work in order for you to be saved. So I don't know where you were at the beginning of this class. Uh, Orthodox, not. I, I hope the pendulum has tipped just by reading this much of it. And we haven't even gotten into all of it yet. 
So the work of Christ is not finished in your life. Well, it, actually it might be. He might have gone through your name already. So what does Jesus investigate is the question. He's there in the inner sanctuary of heaven. He is looking at, in the books, he's looking at every person's name and everything about them. What, what is he looking for to know whether we've made it or not? Well, the first thing that we're going to look at is baptism. At the end of his ministry, Christ commanded his disciples, and we know this verse very well, right? The Great Commission, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. Well, that's the Great Commission. Now, now think about what the Great Commission is telling us. As, as we, we're going to look and see how they define what this means. Okay? We've got the Great Commission. In, his, in this commission, Christ made it clear that he required baptism of those who wished to become part of his church, his spiritual kingdom. Is that what we just read? No. He was commanded to baptize, but he didn't say anything that this is what makes somebody become part of the church, the spiritual kingdom. As a sign of a person's regeneration or new birth. Well, actually, let me step back. There's a lot of words on here. So let me highlight with the blue boxes here. This is talking about the blue boxes are talking about us. This is what we have as a sign of a person's regeneration or new birth. In other words, we as non-Seventh-day Adventists, we can be regenerated by our faith in Christ. We can have new birth. Since it unites the new believer, see we are believers in Christ, they'll acknowledge that. It unites the new believer to Christ, it always functions as the door to the church. Through baptism, the Lord adds the new disciples to the body of believers, his body, the church. Then they are members of God's family. So this statement here, can tell us we can be regenerated, we have new birth, we are new believers, we are new, new disciples. That's the positive side of what it says about us who have faith in Christ. But if we don't have our baptism, it makes this statement, we are not part of Christ's spiritual kingdom, we are not united to Christ, we are not added to the body of believers, and we are not, you know, you're regenerated, but you're not in the spiritual kingdom. You're a new disciple, but you're not a member of God's family. Back and forth and back and forth. It's like juggling here of what they're saying about us. Sometimes discernment, looking through passage like this, it can get pretty muddy. Like, what are they really trying to say? I think they're really espousing a false gospel. There's enough truth in some statements isolated that I think a person can read and understand the gospel. But there's enough statements like this that I think blur it so much that I have to say, according to Seventh-day Adventist teaching from their organization, I don't think the gospel is present. As far as baptism goes, I love this, the Apostle Paul. 1 Corinthians 1.17 says, For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. My friends, if baptism is required for your salvation, Paul would have been preaching baptism and baptizing people. I had a um, friend uh, quite a while ago who used to be part of a uh, Oneness Pentecostal church who they also believed you had to be baptized in order to be saved. And he said, Tim, this is the verse that did it for me. I just couldn't get around this verse. If baptism is the gospel, how, what is Paul talking about? Paul didn't baptize people because that isn't the gospel. It's important. It's something we should do, but it's not the gospel. It's very different. So what, what does Jesus investigate? Number one, we looked at baptism. Number two, Sabbath observance. Do you keep the Lord's Sabbath? And when we talk about Sabbath for them, we're talking about the historic Sabbath, the seventh day Sabbath. So sundown on Friday to sundown on Saturday. That is the Sabbath that they're talking about. That's the Jews still keep it according to that route and that is what Seventh-day Adventists do. So going to church on Sunday, you can't go to church on Sunday and say, well, yes, I observe the Sabbath. I went to church on Sunday. No, 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 no. Don't tell them that. That's not the Sabbath. The Lord's Sabbath is on Saturday. Just as the downtrodden Sabbath was to be restored in Israel, so in modern times the divine institution of the Sabbath is to be restored and the breach in the wall of God's law repaired. See, in the end times, God is going to restore worship the way he meant it to be done. 
worship on God's seventh day Sabbath. None of this Sunday stuff that the Catholic Church or whoever kind of messed with and, and you know, yeah, okay, we, there's some valid criticisms we can give to the Catholics, but man, that's not their fault that we go to church on Sunday. It's not a fault at all. It's not a problem. We can go to church on Sunday, but to them, Seventh-day Adventists, now it's got to be Saturday, and God's work in this end time is to restore proper worship on the Sabbath. It is the proclamation of the message of Revelation 14, 6 through 12 in connection with the everlasting gospel that accomplishes this work of restoring and magnifying the law. Oh, they're Millerites, right? So they're always looking at the end times, talking about the end times, and what is supposed to happen at the end time? Restoring and magnifying the law. At the end times, that's what's supposed to happen. Not magnifying Jesus, it's magnifying the law. Don't be a Jesus follower necessarily. Well, you have to do that as part of the law, but still, restoring and magnifying the law is a work that will happen at the end time and shows us we're near the end. Next paragraph, and it is the proclaiming of this message that is the mission of God's church at the time of the second advent. So did you know that? It's the mission of God's church, restoring and magnifying the law. Well, gosh, who's doing that out there today? Well, Seventh-day Adventists would say they're the ones doing it. Uh, I'd say, is it important to keep God's law? I mean, this is one of their opening sales pitches. Do you believe it's important to, to, to obey God, to do what he tells us to? And Christians, who wouldn't say, yes, let's do it. Uh, I was teaching a class on, on cults at Lancaster Bible College, and I have a, a friend here in the area who was um, a former Seventh-day Adventist pastor. And uh, he's uh, now a pastor of a Church of a Brethren or something like that. And uh, uh, Greg comes into the class, I invite him in, and the students have no idea who this guy is. And they know this is Tim's class on cults. They have no idea who this guy is and what he's going to say to him. I just introduce him as, this is my friend Greg. Uh, I'm not going to tell you where he's from. He'll probably fill you in in a little bit, but he has some things he'd like, you to, he'd like to say to you. So I go and I sit down at my desk and just sit back and have fun. Greg looks at everybody and opens with, do you all believe that it's important to keep God's commandments? The students freeze in their class, the look of terror, and they all look at me like, how do we answer? Because <laughs> they know a trap is coming. Because <laughs> you don't want to say no. Oh, who cares about keeping God's commandments? But they know once they say yes, they're going to be in a trap. And that's the Seventh-day Adventist trap to say, oh, well, yes. Yes, we need to keep God's law. Well, how about the fourth commandment? I think Christians, we need to be aware of the fourth commandment and what does that mean and how do we support it? If you know somebody who's a Seventh-day Adventist and you might end up talking with them, know for yourself. Um, I, I've taught a class on the Sabbath and, and helped me understand where I was and hopefully the class as well. Um, but if you meet Seventh-day Adventists, be prepared to know and how to dialogue about the Sabbath because this is a commandment that needs to be kept to them and they will draw you in with their trap of saying, if you need to keep these commandments, you need to start doing this one too. The observance of the false Sabbath, that's what they call, that's what we do. We have the false Sabbath. We go to church on Sunday. This is the false Sabbath. The observance of the false Sabbath in compliance with the law of the state, contrary to the fourth commandment, will be an avowal of allegiance to a power that is in opposition to God. In compliance with the state, the government even gets involved in this and tells us that we have to go to church on Sunday. Hmm. So we're just going to church on Sunday means that we're now worshiping false gods almost because we're giving them a vow uh, of an allegiance to a power that's against what God has. My hearing aid just died on me. So I can't hear any more questions. I'm just moving on. <laughs> All right. During this final conflict, two distinct classes will develop. One class will advocate a gospel of human devisings and will worship the beast in his image, bringing upon themselves the most grievous judgment. So not only are we you know, following what the government's telling us to do and going to church on Sunday as human devisings, but we're worshiping the beast by going to church on Sunday and we're gonna bring judgment upon ourselves. Move on. 
The other class, in marked contrast, will live by the true gospel and keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So that's how they're magnifying and restoring the law of God. By they, they have the true gospel, they're keeping the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So what they've taken this to mean now is the final issue involves true and false worship, the true and false gospel. So we have the false gospel. It's interesting, you can be a disciple, a new believer, and all these things, but we still have a false gospel because we go to church on Sunday. We're following human devisings and all these other things. With the issue thus clearly brought before him, whoever shall trample upon God's law to obey a human enactment receives the mark of the beast. Now, when they talk about the mark of the beast, um, if you go to church on Sunday, you get means you have the mark of the beast. It's not a physical mark. Uh, the mark. The mark being on the head is um, being deceived about the false Sabbath. The mark being on the hand uh, means someone is going along with it uh, and supports it without necessarily um, believing it or thinking through it. But if you go to church on Sunday, that's the mark of the beast. Um, I remember sitting in uh, Bible college and my professor uh, of uh, we classes, Daniel and Revelations, and he made a comment about the Seventh-day Adventists. He said, you know what, some people say that they're a cult. I don't know why they, they would say that they're a cult. They're not a cult. They, they, you know, they have such great scholarship and great this and that. And so, I don't know why people say that they're a cult. And I'm in my seat going like, oh, man, what do I say? What do I say? What do I? So I have to put my hand up. I can't just sit there and say nothing. I raise my hand. He says, yes, Tim. And I said, do they still believe that if you go to church on Sunday that that's the mark of the beast? I felt so bad for him, I thought he was going to swallow his tongue. <laughs> what? <laughs> I mean, I did. I, I did feel bad for him. I mean, they, they see these guys doing such wonderful scholarly work, and they conclude, how could this be in the category of a cult? But when you hear statements like this written from the Lord's messenger herself, it's kind of hard to get away from. There is a problem <laughs> with their teaching. And backing up this same notion, when this issue is clearly brought before the world, those who reject God's memorial of creatorship, the Bible Sabbath, choosing to worship and honor Sunday, choosing to, uh, choosing to worship and who here chooses to worship and honor Sunday? <laughs> we're, no, we're, we go to church on Sunday. We're not worshiping and honoring Sunday. Now, we would, not con we would not try to tell them that, oh, you're worshiping the Sabbath. That's not what they're doing. That's just when they're going to church. We're not worshiping Sunday. They'll, they'll call us, um, yeah, the, 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 um, the, the false Sabbath. The, this is the, uh, never mind, my mind jumped track. So, uh, the Bible Sabbath, choosing to worship and honor Sunday in the full knowledge that it is not God's appointed day of worship will receive the mark of the beast in full knowledge that it's not God's appointed day. So they're implying that we even know that this is not what God wants of us, and we're doing it anyway. So keep that in the, in the back of your mind. We have just a couple minutes here. Keep that in the back of your mind. They're saying that you're doing this in full knowledge, okay? We're worshiping and honoring Sunday, and we're doing it in full knowledge. Next slide. Every person will have to choose whom to worship. Either one's choice of righteousness by faith will be revealed as one participates in a form of worship God has endorsed. So they're saying if it, for the Seventh-day Adventists who worship God on the, the true memorial Sabbath, they have righteousness by faith. Well, that sounds good. We want righteousness by faith, but how is that shown by their works? Yeah. Or one's effectual choice of righteousness by works will be revealed as one participates in a form of worship God has forbidden, but which the beast and his image command, a man-made worship. That's what we have. Whereas Colossians chapter 2, verse 16 through 17 tells us, Therefore let no one act as your judge in regard to food or drink or in respect to a fest festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day, things which are a mere shadow of what is to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Okay, so, so far we, we've covered what does Jesus investigate? He investigates um, are we baptized and also Sabbath observance. We need to be keeping the Sabbath. The other thing that he's going to look at is 
complete obedience. It's not just keeping the fourth commandment. You know, the Seventh-day Adventists will, will, will love to challenge with you with, well, are, do you think it's important to keep the commandments of God? And we say, well, yeah. Well, what about the fourth commandment? I've got to ask them, well, what about the other nine? Because they believe you have to keep all the commandments of God in order to make it through this investigative judgment. It's not just that one commandment you have to keep, it's all of them that you must keep. In The Great Controversy, this is what Ellen White said. She says, opposite each name in the books of heaven is entered with terrible exactness. Isn't that an interesting way to word it? Terrible exactness. Every wrong word, every selfish act, every unfulfilled duty, and every secret sin with every artful dissembling. Could you imagine a book somewhere written with all this detail about you? Every thought, every deed, every word. Heaven sent warnings or reproofs, neglected, wasted moments, unimproved opportunities, the influence exerted for good or for evil with its far reaching results are all chronicled by the recording angel. So this recording angel is the one who wrote all this stuff down and now Jesus is in the inner sanctuary looking at everything about you, every thought, every deed, every time an angel went to warn you about doing the right thing and you neglected it, it was all written down by the recording angel. Now there's a problem here if you remember what we talked about earlier. What was one of the purposes of the investigative judgment? It was to vindicate the justice of God before who? The angels. Well, the angels are the ones that wrote it down. They know what's, what's written there. So why does Jesus have to go in there and do the investigative judgment if the angels are the ones who wrote it down? And now Jesus needs to vindicate his justice by doing the investigative judgment when they already know what's written there. It doesn't quite make sense. But at, anyway, so the recording angel writes everything down. Now Jesus has to read through this. The law of God is the standard by which the characters and the lives of men will be tested in the judgment. It's not whether you have faith in Christ. That's not the standard in the last judgment. Remember that was dealt with before the names are written in the book of life. If, if you didn't have faith in Christ, well, your name didn't even get written in the book. Now it's the law of God. That's what we're supposed to magnify. That's what we're supposed to be doing, following what God has commanded us to be doing. Does the investigative judgment jeopardize the salvation of those who believe in, in Jesus Christ? And I have a show of hands here. Who here thinks that this would jeopardize your salvation? Only, only one or two, huh? Just a few of you? <laughs> so it's one of those questions like, well, well yes. Your name gets into heaven, but you're not going to get into heaven unless you do everything that you're supposed to do. Everything that God has commanded to you to be done, you have to do it in order to get there. But they say, well, not at all. Genuine believers live in union with Christ, trusting in him as their intercessor. So they would say this doesn't jeopardize. Well, this, this actually causes, causes a lot of angst for those who are Seventh-day Adventists. From, from what I hear from a friend of mine who's a former Seventh-day Adventist, he says, you know, as a Seventh-day Adventist, you, you live in fear. You don't even know if your time has passed. You know, Jesus might have already looked at your name. You know, he started this in 1844, and he's going to start with, with people who are already um, dead in Christ, see how they did. Did they keep the commandments? Did they observe the Sabbath? Did they do everything else? And he's working, he could be working on living people right now. Your time might already pass. You know, we, when we share the gospel with folks, we, we say things like, well, you know, when you, were, well, when you die, it's too late. You know, we want to urge them to think about and consider Christ now. Well, as a Seventh-day Adventist, it might already be too late. Your, salv your salvation or damnation might already be sealed because of this investigative judgment. He might have already gone past you. Christ's work as a high priest is nearing its completion. The years of human probation are slipping away. Remember, they are Millerites. They are Adventists looking for the end. The end is coming. No one knows just when God's voice will, will proclaim it is finished. Take heed. Christ said, watch and pray, for you do not know when the time is. 
So the time is coming to the end, and we don't know when the end is, and it might be too late for you. But there's a, there's a verse in scripture that I, I think is just very helpful with this subject. Titus chapter, uh, in, in Titus here, starting at verse three here, we have, at one time, we too were foolish. L look how it describes what we were like here. We were foolish, we were disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. Does this sound like somebody who would pass the investigative judgment? Well, not, 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 not at all, no, but look how it continues. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of any righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal of the Holy, by the Holy Spirit, by whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior. So even though we were disobedient, deceived, and enslaved, we had malice and envy and hating, he saved us in our sins. He didn't wait until we stopped sinning before he saved us. He saved us even though we're in this unrighteous state. Amen. But what happens after Jesus does his investigative judgment if you fail? And this even has implications if you pass, actually. If, if, you, if you fail and you don't pass the investigative judgment, what's going to happen? Here in their um, Seventh-day Adventist Belief book, it says, to understand what happens to a person at death, one must understand what makes up his or her nature. The Bible portrays a person as an organic unity. At times, it uses the word soul to refer to the whole person, and at other times to the affections and emotions. But it does not teach that man comprises two separate parts. Body and soul only exist together. They form an indivisible union. So what they're saying is you don't have this soul or spirit that survives death. You are just this composite whole. And when you die, you're gone completely. Now, th they mask it by, by calling it soul sleep. Well, it's not soul sleep at all. You're gone. There's not something that continues after you die. Your soul is gone. Your, your body decays and goes away. Um, page 391 here, it says, the soul has no conscious existence apart from the body and no scripture indicates that at death the soul survives as a conscious entity. Now, th this is the same kind of idea that we saw with uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, right? When you die, you're gone completely. So if you pass the investigative judgment, you would get resurrected, but it's not that you have a spirit that is out there with God perhaps, or in a, what they call a soul sleep maybe, or anything. It's gone. God has to then recreate that exactly the way it was here in this world and is in this life. Now, that's, that's kind of a problem. For one thing, it, it says that there's no scriptures that indicates this. We're going to look at a couple in a minute. But, but first of all, just the practical impl implications of what this doctrine does for us. Let's say that you did some, you, you, you were, became a Seventh-day Adventist and you did everything you were supposed to. You started keeping the Bible Sabbath. You honored your parents, you didn't have any kind of greed, and uh, everything you did was right. If we don't think that's possible, but let's just say, for example, that happens, and then you die, you're gone. What comes back? Is it you? Who gets the benefit of you living this perfect, coming to the point of never having sinned life, and then you get brought back? Is that you? Or is that somebody else? I'd have to say that it sounds like it's somebody else. Uh, let's say that if this happened in this life, instead of waiting until after we die that God remakes somebody who looks exactly like us, that remembers everything that we know, if he were to do that, somehow he made an accident and, and, and he recre recreated me. And I were to stand up here beside myself, I'm standing here beside myself up here in front of you, right? You wouldn't be able to tell the difference between us. In fact, we wouldn't be able to tell the difference between us. We both have all the exact memories. We both remember getting in the car driving here today. We look exactly the same. My wife, my children wouldn't know who, which one was which. But the question is, are both of these guys me? No, only one of them is me. 
So if I die and go away and God recreates something that looks like me, that thinks it's me, then somebody else is enjoying the benefits of eternity based on what I did, not what he did. He thinks he did it, but it's not me. See, that's why it's important to understand that we have to have something that survives death. Otherwise, we don't know. Is it really us that comes back? They can do all the, 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 the arguments and the word twisting and different things that I've seen them try to come up with to say that that is you that comes back, but it's not you really. It's somebody else gets the benefits of eternity based on what you have done. So even, even, if, even if that weren't a problem, their statement here is not accurate. You know, there, there's no scripture that indicates that at death the soul survives. Well, let's look, let's look at just a few. Philippians chapter 1, the Apostle Paul says a very curious statement. He says, for me to live as Christ and to die is gain. Well, how could death be gain if once you die you're gone? Your worm food and your soul is gone and everything. Well, he, he says it's gain for him to die because of what he says in verse 23. I desire to, to, to depart death. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better by far. He understands he has some kind of component to him that's going to survive death and be with Christ after he dies. So there is some kind of assurance. We will continue on. That is going to be us. And then again, Revelation 6, 9 through 11 says, I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been slain. These, these, these are people who are dead now. And the Apostle John sees this revelation and sees these souls. And they cried out with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who dwell on the earth? There's souls who survived death and they're crying out to God for vengeance against those who killed them. So if you don't survive the investigative judgment, you don't pass, well, it's not, you, you're gone forever. You know, you're, you might exist in the memory of people who did make it, if any do make this investigative judgment and pass it. But even for those who do pass the investigative judgment, there's this uh, important implication that they're not even gonna have eternal life. They don't get eternal life either. Somebody else gets that instead of them. So, but uh, that, that ends my section on uh, Seventh-day Adventism. We did not go into any depth in, in, a, in a biblical look. I mean, we looked at some snapshots of verses to show kind of a problem with their system, but I'm hoping that this will at least open your mind to that there is so much more to the Seventh-day Adventist than what they will let on to uh, and that we need to realize. If you know Seventh-day Adventists, if you know um, people in the workplace or in your neighborhood or whatever, um, love them in the truth. And um, if anything I can do to be a supportive to you in that, and let me know, because um, this is what we do. We want to help support and encourage and equip the church to know the difference between the counterfeits and the true Christians. I mean, the question is, when you see these different groups walking down the street, do you need to fellowship with them or to witness to them? And we want to help you make that disti distinction in your ministry. Thank you.